Yeah, guten Morgen. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, the next talk is going to be by Bicycle Mark. He's known as a video blogger. And um, he is going to talk about a very um, exciting or interesting topic. It's the new war about the Arctic. And um, it's going to be about power. It's going to be about influence. It's going to be about states. And um, I mean, it's going to be about the little Norway and against the big Russia that both want um, part of the new land because of the natural resources, oil. So it's going to be a good talk and an exciting talk. Please welcome all Bicycle Mark. Thank you. Well, good, technically good morning for most of you, right? First of all, I appreciate that you all came out tonight. I was probably out with half of you last night, and most of you looked at me and said, good luck tomorrow, I won't be there. So I'm glad you're here anyway, although I don't see any of the people from the bar. Oh, OK. All right, well, this is my second, um, well, I was going to say 24C3, but that would be the first 24C3. It's my second Congress, and last time I was here, I spoke about a general topic, which was what I do. So let's cover that real quick. My name is Bicycle Mark. I have a real name, too, but it's too long to explain. Uh, I do a podcast, and when I say I do a podcast, I should say I do a podcast in the journalistic style. I do what I call investigative reports. Some people might say they're just reports, and that's at citizenreporter.org. That is my program. And I look at topics that are underreported, uh, that I believe deserve more attention in the media and in our general conversations uh, that aren't receiving that attention. And I do this by doing my own research, much like we do in our own interests, uh, whatever your interest is. And I do that by talking to people who work in the field. And in the case of the Arctic Cold War, it's no different. Uh, I've done my own research, as many of you could. So in many ways, I'm just a, a storyteller. I'm not a scientist. I've seen a lot of people giving talks going, I'm not a scientist. I am not a scientist either. I am a concerned citizen. I am a journalist. And I happen to have an outlet where I can put all of my research and my stories up. So that's basically me, right? I'm a podcasting journalist, not a scientist. And that's important because when you talk about the Arctic, there's a lot of scientific aspects to it. And the, the problem is, of course, you can use facts in your favor if you're Russia or if you're US and, and all that. And we'll get into that. But it's important to note that I'm not here to give a scientific explanation. I'm here to explain an issue that affects every single person in this room. And I know that because I'm pretty sure we all live on Earth most of the day. And, um, and this is something that affects us no matter where we live. Just because it's going on in the Arctic, where many of us have never been, doesn't mean it doesn't have to do with us. But we'll come back to that. Let's start with the Arctic Cold War. Um, we call it Arctic. Oh yeah, I added that. This is the only f weird graphics that I'll do. Um, it's funny, because when you think of the Arctic, oh yeah, the remote only works from back here. When you think of the Arctic, um, you don't really think of guns and not necessarily money, not yet. Um, you don't think of a lot of evil shit. You think of penguins, especially marching penguins, and you think of polar bears, and you think of ice, whatever's left of it, and you think of generally nice things. But in fact, to me, after doing the research that I've done, and in the coming years, you might hear more about it, you might if the media reports about it, um, all these things are involved in the, the battle for the Cold War. These are not just random images. These are actually images that are somehow tied into the story, some a little more obscure than others. Um, so what are we talking about? The Arctic Cold War. You remember the term Cold War. Uh, some of us were alive then. I was like in my first years of life. Uh, but I have some vague memory. A Cold War was one in which Okay, a lot of things happened, but um, it wasn't so much that guns were fired, although they were in different parts of the world. It was more a war of uh, brinkmanship, of almost fighting, of gathering so many weapons and pointing them at your enemy, and your enemy gathering so many weapons and pointing them back at you that somehow life somehow went on. And this is a cold war, the threat of a real war, uh, the, the amassing of weapons for some purpose. Now, the Arctic is a little different, of course. We don't have, um, you know, NATO and, well, we do have NATO, but we don't have member states that are on one side or the other. We don't have a Soviet Union, but we do have Denmark. 
And of course, I'm sorry for all the Danish people, but there are going to be a couple of tongue-in-cheek Denmark moments uh, because the Arctic is a major issue for Denmark, and it's really weird to see Denmark with a major global issue that they're willing to fight for. Um, so let's begin. If yeah, who runs the Arctic? Um, not Santa Claus, obviously. Although I did run into some documents that claimed, um, and I might mention them later. But uh, who runs the Arctic? I mean, I wrote no one in the beginning there because. Technically, when the Arctic, uh, well, all this stuff that's going on, the, the conflict that I'm going to describe, has only really been going on in the last 10 years. The only real discussion of who will run the Arctic really started around the 70s. And to cut right to the chase, it was when they realized that the whole thing was melting and that maybe there was something under there that they could use. That's when the real discussion started about who runs it. Originally, nobody runs it, and it was administered by the United Nations. Um, yeah, there's this thing called the International Arctic Science Committee, which, as far as I know, is a bunch of scientists that have good intentions or at least curious intentions about the Arctic, because, as you may know, the Arctic is important for all matters when it comes to temperature uh, of the Earth, not just in the Arctic, uh, ecosystem, oceans, uh, everything is connected. Whatever happens in the Arctic affects us down here, for sure. So. The Arctic was run by this thing called the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is really boring but really important. The Law of the Sea says, "Oh, I, I'm going backwards." But anyway, the Law of the Sea says basically, among other things, when it comes to the Arctic,、um, at the top of the Arctic you have—I have a map. Well, well, we'll get to that. You have, of course, you have Canada up top. And then around the other side, you have Russia, you have Greenland, which belongs to Denmark, and、uh, you also have Alaska. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about Sweden or Iceland, or well, we'll talk about Norway, but no Sweden or Iceland. I'm sorry, no Finland either. I'm sorry, because they're not involved in the Arctic Cold War as much. So the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea says anything within 200 nautical miles—I forget how many kilometers that is. I don't even know how many 200. Okay, I don't even know how many like. 200 miles is really anymore. I'm in between countries,、um, but it says that amount of space outside of your in your waters belongs to you. And not only does that water belong to you,、uh, what's under it belongs to you. So you can extract oil as Norway does, 200 nautical miles outside of Norway. That's according to the law of the sea. That's yours. The Arctic is supposed to be managed in a way related to the law of the sea, which means. 200 miles away from Russia, that's Russian. Of course, the Arctic extends much more beyond that. And what's going on right now is that there's another part of the law of the sea that says you can do something else. First of all, I mentioned the exclusive economic zone. Whatever is under the water is yours. The water is yours. The air is yours. It's your airspace.、Um, but there's a little but in there. If you can prove that the undersea shelf There's an undersea shelf. There's land, basically, that connects to your 200 miles that you already have. That's yours too, but you have to put in a claim, and you have to put in a claim. Stay with me.、Uh, at least 10 years after you've ratified the law of the sea. So, in the case of the United States, they never ratified it, which. Goes with a lot of things that the United States never ratifies, like mines against children、uh, or mining and、uh, using landmines.、Um, well, you name it, the U.S. hasn't ratified it. But so one more to that list: the law of the sea. The U.S. hasn't ratified it, so they don't have a claim quite yet. But they do claim that that part next to Alaska is theirs. Canada has the claim,、uh, saying that hey, the Arctic was always. Ours, the whole Arctic. We've sort of managed because they're connected. Russia has a claim too. They've all ratified the treaty within the last nine years. So I'm talking about the 90s. So we're coming up to that time. That's why I'm saying I'm talking to you today because we're coming up to that time where they've ratified the treaty and they've made the claims. And what they're claiming, everybody, is that they own the Arctic or they own most of the Arctic. And who's going to decide if they do or not is the United Nations. So, just to make sure we have all the players in this little piece of theater,、uh, we've got the United States, the most famous actor, and I have to say, an actor that in this film is not the biggest asshole.、Uh, no, no, it's true. It's not. 
And you, I hope you're clapping because you're proud, because it's true. The United States is not always the biggest asshole. It's just assumed. <laughs> I, have, I am not loyal to my land of birth. If it was the asshole, I would say so. But no, Russia is up there. It might win the Oscar for assholishness. Um, Russia is one of the major players, and we'll get to all these individual claims. Canada is a major player in this, obviously for, for reasons that are quite visible, right? Uh, Denmark, who owns Greenland, I'm sorry if that's not politically correct, but they do. Um, and I am sorry, because maybe they shouldn't, but uh, anyone from Green... Do we have a, anyone from Greenland at the Hacker Congress? Have we ever? We should. Um, there is Norway. It's a small part, but an important part. Um, did I mention everybody? Well, there they are, the actors in this piece of theater. I'm sorry that I move so much <laughs> for cameras. Um, so what's the big deal about the Arctic? The gentleman who introduced me uh, said oil. A lot of people have, have heard that there's oil in the Arctic. It's an easy sort of guess, like, ah, oh, it must be oil. If, if nations are fighting, there must be oil. As I guess we learned from that steam-powered play, it's a puppet show the other day. Um, yes, there's oil. Um, I, I put potentially in big letters because um, in the end, we're not 100% positive. Uh, the problem with the Arctic is, first of all, you have to go under ice. Second of all, you have to go very deep. Again, I'm not a scientist. Uh, but it's assumed that 10%, what is it, 10%? 10% of global oil, so the total oil of the world, 10% of it is probably under the Arctic, and they have some proof to that effect. But there's more. Oh yes, there's more. 29% of global natural gas is thought to be under the Arctic. And uh, well, then there's the passageway, right? Because if you look, there's even some arrows there that look good. Um, this would be a cool place, cool meaning, uh, well, good. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to be cold anymore, don't worry. Um, but it would be a cool place if you wanted to go on vacation to California or Japan, and you thought, man, I hate that Atlantic Ocean, so much traffic this time of year. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm doing it very tongue-in-cheek, but actually there are a lot of people, especially in the shipping world, who would very much like this. Um, and we'll get to the passage in just a moment. Let's do the root thing. We'll put oil and gas to the side for once, for a little while. We'll get right to it. The passage thing is interesting. So, if you have an, a tanker company, some of you might, and you're into sending oil tankers around the world, because obviously that's what makes the world go round. Um, oil, I mean. You have to pass through, sometimes, the Suez or the Panama Canal, if you want to cross Atlantic to Pacific or vice versa. Uh, if you want to go to Suez to go to the Indian Ocean. It's like a geography test. This whole talk is a geography test. And um, so those two canals are controlled by countries. And if you use it, as far as I know, because I've never crossed, you have to pay a fee. Uh, and somebody has to maintain it and all this. Well, now there's a third way. And that third way is, uh, for the first time ever, it's just about ready. And what I mean by ready is that the ice has melted to such an extent in the Arctic that ships will now be able to pass. Uh, that is, if I could add in even more commentary, that's crazy, but it's true. Um, so ships can now pass without going through the Panama Canal, without going through Suez, to get to the other side of the world. Now, they're not doing it yet, but one of the first ships passed, I believe, this year or last year, 2006, 2007. For me, both those years are a blur, so it must have been at some point. Um, the first ship passed through, so this is just the beginning. But the idea is that <laughs> by 2015, 2015, that's like, 2008 is like tomorrow, so, or two days from now. So by 2015, uh, most of the polar ice will be gone. We're pretty close to that level at this point anyway. I'll show you a nice graph with nice colors and stuff. Um, so, 40% reduction in travel time between the Atlantic and the Pacific. You just go right over Canada. It's wide. It's so wide, in fact, I think you could probably send bigger oil rigs, which is going to be another thing, an oil tanker. You know, in the Suez and the Panama Canal, you have a limit of how big it can be. I'm wondering, and no one mentions this, when you can go through the uh, Arctic, will you build even bigger oil tankers? And what does that mean if there's ever an accident? Um, so I put another example, since we're in Germany, Hamburg to Yokohama, normally 18,000 400 kilometers through the 
Northwest Passage or the passage through the Arctic, 11,100 kilometers. This is like an advertisement for going through there. And for a limited time, no. Uh, normally available in summer, the Global Passage will be available all year round because the Earth is getting warmer. Plan your vacations, plan your vacations. No, this is, I, I don't even want to make too many jokes, not too many. Uh, there's a white line showing you one of the, the paths. Basically, it's going over Canada and into the Pacific around Alaska. This will be one of the major paths. And the question is going to become, whoever controls it, if, if all these nations, one of the nations, wins their claim, how will they manage it? Uh, I've heard Canada wants people to ask permission, um, which is kind of polite of them. But what if they want to charge a toll? You know, what if they set up some like, little booth, <laughs> this guy in a little ice booth? <laughs> you want to go through here? Give me, give me some loonies, you know, and you have to pay loonie. That's money in Canada. Isn't that crazy? Loonies. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of what this looks like. Okay, a little bit on resources because it's such a big deal in all of this. I mean, money is a big part of the equation. Uh, you know, Russia, big power in the world, they love gas and oil, they really do. Um, 586 billion barrels of oil in the Arctic, according to Russia, in what will be the Russian part of the Arctic. And I'll show you a little film to illustrate this in a moment. If Russia gets its claim, and now here's where the numbers get weird, two-thirds of global hydrocarbon, so I think that's oil, gas, and I don't know, hydro? Anyway, two-thirds of the world's global hydrocarbon reserves would be controlled by Russia because they already have a lot. Now they would have even more. Uh, so they estimate, I guess they like to raise the numbers a little, they estimate that they'll have two-thirds of the world's control. That means they'll be more powerful than Saudi Arabia, of course, when it comes to energy. Of course, Saudi Arabia has the biggest oil reserves right now. Um, also worth mentioning, 69% uh, of the, the oil and gas in the Arctic would belong to Russia if they get their claim. And I'll talk to you about the claim in just a moment. But it's important to understand that this is so important to Russia or to the other actors involved that in some cases you have to ask yourself how far are they willing to go to control it. And I have some examples of how far they are willing to go. Uh, oh, I should hit pause. Does, I know it's a little late. Does, if I put up in this audio cable, can you uh, make it work? Which should be easy. I put in... Uh, it, it. Yes, technology. All right. There was a big event. I call it the planting. Um, it was over the summer while we were all hanging out. I think uh, most of us were in... Some of us were in a little pool with a computer at the camp. Um, Actually, there wasn't that much room in that pool. But um, while we were doing that, the Russians, because of what I just mentioned, how important this claim is, and they want to prove, because you have to prove to the United Nations that you really have a connection to this land, and they claim that most of the Arctic is an extension underwater of Russia. And they're not the only crazy people. Sorry, they're not the only ones. Denmark claims the same thing. Oh, and so is Canada. Not United States. They don't claim that. So over the summer, they sent submarines, because you know Russia has a lot of submarines doing nothing. Um, <laughs> so do most countries. <laughs> so does Germany, actually. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they sent submarines uh, to go underwater and plant a flag. I have film of it. Now, this is uh, from a Canadian... Um, documentary or news report done on the story. I just wanted you to see the image of the flag going in the ground. It's just like the moonwalk. Go. It's important. A recent Russian scientific expedition to the Arctic even sent a submarine to plant the Russian flag in the seabed, an exercise greeted with scorn by the other claimants. Now there's the uh, astronauts, I mean scientists. <laughs> so that's just some bald guy. Um, He's important. He's the ambassador to Canada. Hang on. <laughs> but, you know, robotic arm, flag in the ground. And it's like, wow, that does kind of resemble the moon landing. Now, I, had a, I did a program on this. I'm working on a few others. And my correspondent, I have a correspondent, he's my friend, in uh, Moscow said, um, I don't know if anybody was there. You can tell me later. Um, 
that in Russia, at least with the media, it was like the moon landing. The, the people who did it were like celebrities when they came home. It was a big deal. You planted a flag under the Arctic. So I wonder if it really was. Uh, please, somebody later on let me know. Maybe in the question time. So they planted a flag, and this is like the shot heard round the world for the Arctic Cold War, because now everybody's like, "Fuck, they're clever." <laughs> I gotta, I gotta give credit to Eddie Izzard. He said that first, actually. The planting of flags is clever.、Um, so everybody has to make a response to this because it was too big of a deal. You can't not say anything. He planted a flag.、Uh, just some details. The point of the exhibi- exhibition, expedition, was to gather evidence to support the Russian claim.、Um, so they planted the flag. It was July 2007. So we weren't quite at camp yet.、Um, and the ridge is called the Lumonosov Ridge.、Um, And that's this underwater mountain chain. Of course, it's underwater, so it's not like mountains to us. But、uh, that they claim is Russia. So of course we have reactions all over the world. Not really in the media, but they happened. It got like 30 seconds of airtime on CNN.、Uh, the U.S. has to look tough here. We want the oil. We want the control. A lot of this presidents do that. So they scramble the icebreakers to break ice and go north. Uh, of course, the U.S. has a problem. They don't have that many icebreakers. They've been busy building other things. <laughs> they don't have that many icebreakers, so they sent whatever they had, which was like the rusty.、Uh, what do you got left? Go up the break ice. <laughs> they increase Arctic air patrols. Now, again, I'm, make, I'm smiling when I say this, but this shit is serious. <laughs> They've got guns, you know.、Um, So they they increased the Arctic air patrols. It was an order. More planes flying over the Arctic. And by the way, when they scrambled the icebreakers, it was to do more mapping of the ocean floor. Now, when they do this, they want to find connections to the United States or just connections that say this is not Russia,、yeah? or this is not Canada, because there's a big fight between Canada and the U.S. here. And I'll show you more about that in a moment.、Um, and now Congress, which can't get much done, but. They want to boost funding for the Coast Guard and Arctic missions. They want to throw them about a billion. I put in some text, but that's way too much text to read.、Um, they put about a billion dollars towards new Arctic fleet, new Arctic icebreakers. The funny part is you don't really need icebreakers in a couple of years because there's no ice. <laughs> but since when do you build things that you actually, you know? <laughs> Never mind. Um, oh, this the, is the American response. The Northwest Passage, if and when it's navigable, is a strait to be used for international navigation. Pure and simple. Now you know that Canada argues it's not an international strait. Well, we we understand that, and we we do not agree uh, with uh, ca- Canadian claims that it's、uh, internal waters. But this really is not a dispute between the United States and Canada. This is a dispute between Canada and the world. Canada and the world. Canada in the world. I like when he says that.、Like... So again, America is saying, "Hey, Canada is out of control," and I'll show you why Canada is out of control. In response, now Canada has a, a conservative prime minister. If you voted for him, congratulations. He's he's in power, and he's a little different than most prime ministers because he says weirder shit. I find I find he says weirder shit. And one of his first things was, and I have bits of the speech. Hold on,、um, was Canada will defend the Arctic. I mean that that sounds a little weird to me, but they're serious. He's so serious he launched Operation Nanook, which was also known as Operation Icy Beaver. <laughs> I seriously saw references to it as Icy Beaver. I don't know. <laughs> They sent two surface ships, a submarine, and 700 military personnel conducting maneuvers. Now we can laugh about maneuvers, but the maneuvers involve things with guns and and rocket-propelled things. And I'll show you. Hold on, I say that the whole this whole speech is me going. I'll show you. Big speeches, big speeches by Prime Minister Stephen Harper, talking about defending the North. The Arctic has always been Canada's backyard. Sorry,、I、said sorry a lot.、Um, So they have their claim, and he promises two new military bases. Did I mention that? Oh, and an Arctic national sensor system for detecting foreign submarines and foreign ships. I mean, they want to detect foreign submarines and foreign ships in the Arctic, which is technically international. Here's Canada. 
Do the speech. A Canadian Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, who campaigned for election on a platform of protecting the North, is aware of the potential economic threat from the Russians, the Europeans and even the Americans. During a three-day visit to the region, he announces the construction of several polar-class patrol ships and a deep-water port in the Arctic. The Arctic archipelago is an integral, indivisible part of the true North strong and free, and that we will not compromise the defence or the sovereignty of Canadian territory. So this is footage from the little like PR About campaign 6, they did. 6,000 people live in Iqaluit and they welcome the troops. They know that their land and their way Wait. of life need protecting. I mean, this is real. Okay. Now they interview uh, Eskimos about being part of the Canadian Army. The Canadian... Now, now, you know, we joke a lot at this conference, and, and I find myself joking a little too much. Um, they really did, and they really have done this. I mean, they are really building these bases. They really do hand out these guns. Um, they really are arming themselves to defend the North. And you might be sitting there wondering, defend against who? Russia? I mean, they're friends. They know each other. We know Ru Canadians know Russians. But they're actually proposing that militaries get ready. Again, it's a cold war. I mean, it's because it's funny, because it's a cold war we can laugh about, but they really are arming themselves. So if they're not arming themselves to fight, then why the hell are they arming themselves, is the question that we really have to kind of ask ourselves. Uh, how am I... Okay, I'm fine on time. <laughs> now, the Danish. I'll try not to poke too much fun. I, li I like Denmark. Uh, Danish get very mad. Okay, because Dane, as I said, Denmark has Greenland. Greenland is, used to be covered by ice. It's melting faster than you can say melting ice. <laughs> it is very quickly. And so, um, well, despite that melting, there's a, a lot of fuel to go around up there, underground. And Denmark has dismissed the claims. The Prime Minister says, Denmark, Lumanasov Ridge is Denmark's. And so, as a response, this is just an article from that, that moment after the submarine. Copenhagen launches an expedition. Now, Denmark does it a little bit different. I actually like how they do it. They send 40 scientists. Hey, if you're going to talk about science, send 40 scientists. And the mission, and I really found this text. It was a quote, I think. The quote was, go and gather evidence that the ridge underground, the ridge, the ridge underwater, is actually part of Greenland. So the Russians send a submarine and go, go find out that that ridge is part of Russia. The Danish send a submarine that says, go find out that that bridge is part of Denmark. If you're a scientist, you must be going, oh shit, what am I supposed to do today? Okay. <laughs> um, and as a bonus, I hate to poke so much fun because it's weird. It's not even funny, it's weird. But there is a small island between Canada and Denmark that has been disputed for many years. It's called Hans Island. It is about 1.3 kilometers big. And every few years, I mean, this is serious, money is spent on this shit. Every few years, the prime minister of either Canada or Denmark goes to the island, puts a flag down, and buries liquor? <laughs> they really do this. I, I don't know how it works. I think, um, I think the Canadian buried... Oh, I don't know. What's a good Danish whiskey? If you find the articles, they really do. Besides planting the flag, they, bo they bury a bottle of their best liquor. So just to make everybody laugh, I guess, I found the uh, Hans Island Liberation Front. <laughs> There's a great text here which talks about how we can't have any more flags on this small island. I keep stumbling over shit on my way across the island. <laughs> now, the island is uninhabited, and it's, like I said, small. It's a bunch of rocks. Um, sorry, it's a piece of land. I'm sorry to Hans Island uh, admirers. You can't be a native. Um, but they really do send ships and they send personnel. They're really spending our money, if you're a citizen anyway, our money on this shit. I mean, this is what's weird. Anyway, this is sort of a humorous side. Let me go back to some serious shit. Norway. Any Norwegians here? Sure, there gotta be. Yeah, you know, nice people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice people, but... Uh, you know, they got a lot of oil, and they like oil. It's doing them a lot of good. So Norway is very silent on this whole thing. You don't, I, I, I've looked and looked for reactions from the Danish prime minister. I don't even know his name. Um, he says nothing. 
And I asked myself, why does he say nothing? And as I researched it, I found that the Russian, the big oil company in Russia is Gazprom, uh, state-run now, more or less. And, uh, well, it seems that Norway is heavily, nego not negotiating, they're in uh, cooperation with Gazprom. So whatever Russia wants in the Arctic, Norway is not going to say much about it, because if Russia gets it, then Norway is involved, because Norway has expertise in deep uh, oil drilling. They've been doing it in the North Sea and closer to the Arctic already anyway. So as whatever Russia gets, Norway also will get. So in this whole little battle of sending around scientists and military, Norway keeps pretty quiet. Uh, now, obviously, you can hear my opinion in that, in, but it's more than my opinion. It's a fact. Go look. Uh, I wanted to mention Greenland. I kind of already did. 10 million barrels of oil. That's a lot of oil. In the northern shelf of Alaska, this is why the U.S. is interested, uh, there's about 6 billion barrels of oil. And uh, you may remember, especially the Americans, that there's this place in Alaska called the National Arctic Wildlife Reserve. And um, it's a wildlife reserve. So it's for, you know, preserving nature and animals. Uh, somebody found out that there's oil under there. So now they're rethinking the whole preserving nature thing. <laughs> and they've been doing this for many years. It hasn't passed yet. Uh, but every few years, the Republicrats pass a, or try to propose a bill that says, um, get rid of the Ar Arctic wildlife. No, no, no. The bill says, let's drill underneath them. We promise we won't hurt the animals. <laughs> That's not the legal text, but... And, uh, and this bill is making a comeback um, in a different form now. Uh, so it may be possible that in the next few years, it almost seems unavoidable. I hate to be a pessimist, that um, they will drill in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, which is right on the Arctic Circle or slightly above. So the U.S. is also very interested in what happens with uh, oil claims and access to the Arctic. Of course, I have to mention the corporations. Uh, all the typical ones are around. I have to know what time it is and how I'm doing on time. Otherwise, somebody will get hurt. Okay. Um, Exxon is in Russia and Alaska. Of course, they're not just there, they're everywhere, but their big interests are in Russia and Alaska. Shell is in Canada. Of course, Shell is everywhere again. BP is in Alaska. Stat Oil of Norway is in Russia and also, of course, in the North Sea, so they're involved with Russia. And, of course, Gazprom, which one day I think all of our gas will come from, um, is involved. I wanted to mention the corporations because sometimes I, I talk about countries, but I'm really talking about countries that work for corporations in this case. I mean, they're doing work that will influence what happens with corporations. Now, you should realize, since we're all very aware of the environment, I think, at, at this kind of conference, that the Arctic has tremendous impact in general on what happens to our, our weather, uh, our ocean levels. You know, if this Arctic ice keeps melting, and it will, uh, if it keeps melting at the rate that it's going, our ocean levels will rise dramatically. So my current home of Amsterdam will be in Atlantis, and, uh, well, Berlin will be a coastal city. And, I mean, you know the scenarios. This is not new, but we have to make sure that we realize that what these people do, these governments and these companies, with the Arctic, could even further speed up the destruction of the ice, could further dis uh, destru destroy the uh, ecosystem, and it will have an effect on us. Of course, global temperature, again, I'm not a scientist, but uh, Arctic ice reflects back heat. Uh, if there's no Arctic ice, then we'll just collect more heat and we'll be much warmer. The oceans will be warmer. Um, our planet will be warmer, even warmer than it is now. And of course, there's this little thing about, um, and I'm not very good with this science, but the, if the ice keeps melting at the rate that it is, the salt level, the, the, the saltiness of the sea will be diluted, and so everything that sort of exists on this salt water sort of system will be thrown completely out of balance. So all your favorite fish will be dead, unless they like fresh water. Um, it's important to remember these things because this is all hanging in the balance. Like I said, ice cover by the time 2015 gets here, so I'll only be 35 years old, and there will be pretty much no more ice cover in the Arctic. I said this. Oh, and of course, Underneath all this, I know you recognize this, no matter what they do with oil drilling, with gas, well, yeah, gas as well, um, there's always the risk that they have an accident. And that's something no company or government wants to admit. But whenever they do these sort of activities, the more they do, there's always that chance there's an accident. And if there's an accident, a lot of pe people, I mean, people live in the region, animals, the oceans, everything is affected. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that I bring this topic to you today. So the chess match has begun. And it's funny because people don't always make these connections, but since I have the uh, podium today, I will. 
Um, what I mean by chess match is it's, a, it's like a cold war. You make a move, the other side makes a move. Uh, so I noticed this in September. Russia sent bombers. Now, they have a lot of old bombers that need some exercise. Um, it's true, it's true, and I think a mechanic will tell you that probably, if you ask one. Um, Russia sent bombers to just fly over the Arctic. They're taking a lot of photos. Obviously, they want to know what their future piece of real estate is going to look like. And when they did this, they intercepted, or hmm, they invaded? No, a bad word. Um, they flew into NATO airspace. So Norwegian radar picked it up, made a phone. I think they used phones. I don't know. They, they called the UK, and they scrambled fighter jets, tornadoes. That's why I had a picture of a tornado in the beginning. To go and confront the Russian bombers. I think they fly by each other. I don't really... They'd probably go... <laughs> but, I mean, this really happened, and it made like barely like page 20. I found it in The, uh, the Guardian. Um, I remember when it happened, and, and nothing happened. They didn't shoot at each other, but it was an aggressive move, and there were some speeches given by some generals, like, we don't know anything about it. Um, so, I mean, this is one example of a sort of chess match. This week, uh, I think the first day of the conference here, Russia tested a new ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. That's totally Cold War. And of course, you know, they, don't, they didn't say it's because of the Arctic. But it's funny, when you want to show strength, and you want to sort of, just like in the old days of the Cold War, you launch a new missile. You say, look, we built this missile, and it can reach, oh, Washington, Copenhagen, Tokyo. Not that we would. <laughs> And so, actually, I encourage you, and I'll be looking for it. I, what I do with my time, instead of having a social life, I pay attention to these sort of this, these moves, because they're building new kinds of missiles, new kinds of ships. They're promising all kinds of things, and some of this is to be used for the Arctic, the quest to look tougher. If you're Denmark, the quest to control Hans Island. <laughs> and so, my my sort of final questions, although there's a bonus film coming up. Um, is, you know, why should anyone, first of all, editorial now, total editorial, uh, why should anyone control the Arctic? Um, for a long time, it was a, a, cold <laughs> a cold place. And there was a place where scientists could go and do research, and it was a place that nations agreed belonged to nobody. Unfortunately, at that time, it was just because it was so cold that nobody wanted to try and own it. Now, they see opportunity, they see dollar signs, they see land that needs a flag. My other question is, why are media and citizens not making connections between their lives and what happens in the Arctic? I mean, I, again, I asked my Russian uh, correspondent, and he said, nobody in Russia gives a shit. Okay, he's making a generalization. But he said, you know, when it happened, people here, there was some, like, fanfare for the scientists who came home, you know, like they'd been on the moon. Uh, but otherwise, people just said, well, more oil is good for Russia. Nobody makes the connection that what they do in the Arctic one single mistake, or even no mistakes, building of, of oil rigs and, and drilling has a huge effect on what happens right back in Moscow, which apparently is suffering the coldest winters in years over the last decade. Um, who supports these activities? I mean, that's the weird part. You may not like them, you may not even notice them, but who the hell votes for these people? I mean, who voted for a Stephen Harper, some of you did, uh, who says Canada must defend the Arctic with guns and missiles? He didn't say it, but he does it. Um, well, that's a classic question, you know, who voted for Bush? Who voted for these guys who were in charge? Oh, hold on, there'll be a question thing and then... But it is the ultimate question that I have, and that's sort of leading to the idea that if we kind of live in some form of democracy, then if we don't like this happening in the world, and there's plenty of reason not to like it, then we could do something about it. We could say to a leader, very simply, uh, if you start clowning around with guns and missiles and ships, uh, and making speeches about planting flags in the Arctic, then I won't vote for you anymore. Matter of fact, I will ruin you, because I will simply write, look, I have a prime minister who thinks that there's going to be some kind of a big confrontation in the Arctic, and he may not fire a bomb necessarily, but he's going to have us test bombs and run around in circles, because maybe one day, maybe, we'll, uh, we'll have a fight. Um, and lastly, a very important question, why should weapons of mass destruction and lives be used as chess pieces in... Um, in the global energy game. You know, it's so funny. You send soldiers, you spend money that could be spent on plenty of better things that we could all discuss. 
Um, you spend, instead, you spend that money on controlling the Arctic or on planting a flag or on sending the military to do exercises. Uh, I, the question I have is, you know, why should these things be used? If you want to have a political discussion, have a political discussion. Meet at a desk, have an argument. I'm cool with that. But using guns and missiles and military, I'm not cool with that. Uh, that is about it for today. I do have a... Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, this is the, another film going on. In the south, there's a place called the Antarctic. It's the anti-Arctic. And there's a, a fight going on there, too. And that's... We'll have to come back next year, and I'll give another speech. Um, and that's between the UK, Australia, Chile, Argentina, New Zealand, Norway, and France. I don't know who the biggest asshole is in that one yet. But there's another fight going on with the same kind of stories. Uh, less on the military, as far as I know, but uh, still with the same kind of, we own it, you own it, it's ours, you can't have it, I want this piece. When did the Arctic and the Antarctic stop being international areas? And when did we stop wanting to cooperate together to do research? Here's a bonus video, and then I'm done. Global warming is melting the Arctic, leading to a frantic territorial dispute for access to oil, gas, and mineral reserves. Russia recently made headlines by planting a flag deep under the sea in a bid to stake its claim to the region. And so, Greenpeace decided to launch its own Arctic expedition to reclaim the region for all humankind. And here is totally authentic footage of their undersea adventure. All the important systems part. go, beginning descent. When you get to the bottom, look for the flag. We need to get it out of here and reclaim the Arctic before they start drilling. I'm at the bottom. Do you see the flag? Yep, got it. Now the Arctic should be safe for a while. Uh, Arctic belongs to Russia. Arctic has always been Russia. We are here to claim the sovereign rights of the Arctic for Denmark. Oh, Greenland! I mean Greenland! Don't forget Canada, eh? We've got this mighty icebreaker battle duck. USA! 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 We're number one! I think we're going to need some help! Uh... That was, by the way, produced by uh, Greenpeace, as far as I know. I don't work for them, but I like the video, especially if you need to explain this situation to either children or really uninterested adults. <laughs> Do I have time for questions? Okay. I will need a microphone. That's a... Oh, there's a microphone. That, that person right there. Thanks. Um, actually, I work for Greenpeace. Thanks for showing the movie. Oh, um, I heard clapping, yeah. Um, <laughs> I wanted to propose you to show it, but thanks, you, you have been fa faster. Uh, but actually, you didn't show the end of the movie. There's a URL so everybody can join Greenpeace and support the idea of protecting the Arctic. So maybe you just show the end or just uh, give you the URL. It's www.greenpeace.org slash hands off the Arctic. Yeah. So, Thank you for the time. I didn't do a, the, the uh, attribution. Bad me. <laughs> Anybody else? Remember, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> I don't want to answer science questions. Just a very quick comment. Uh, Statoil and Hydro have merged very recently. Yes, they're called Statoil Hydro. Uh, yes. Yeah? And they, they're constantly changing their minds about the company name, uh, but uh, it's uh, some permutation of Statoil and Hydro. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Statoil, the Norwegian oil company, is involved in much more than oil. <laughs> and of course, if you go to their website, you can't find much info about oil anymore. It's just alternative energy, and there's big pictures of wind-powered things. <laughs> Thank you. Oh! Uh, just another comment on uh, the Norwegians. Um, I think I read somewhere that uh, the, at least some of the officials uh, believe that uh, once... Uh, Russians come with weapons, uh, the NATO won't come to help the Norwegians. Maybe the Norwegians can uh, clear that up, but that's what I read, that they're really afraid that no one's going to help them, so that's, that might be the reason why they're trying to work with the Russians to get what they want. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure there's a conflict there, as always, as Americans will tell you, or as Russians will tell you, there's what the oil company does, and there's what the, the people of a nation believe. I mean, I'm sure in Norway, people, uh, first of all, would like to protect the uh, Arctic, or I hope, uh, and, and don't necessarily want, uh, for example, Russia to control the Arctic. Um, 
But yeah, I, I, I had a hard time, like I said, finding any material on Norwegians, uh, on Norway, and I haven't uh, really had a Norwegian correspondent who's an expert on this issue yet, but I will find one. Thank you. Hi. So uh, you said there's going to be no ice up in the Arctic in 2015. Um, and you there's also said when there's no ice, pretty much huge amounts of territory are going underwater. So are you saying huge amounts of territory are going to be underwater in 2015? Uh, first, uh, there will be, the first part is there will still be ice. Uh, I think I have a nice graphic to show you, but uh, basically by 2015, the passage will be completely open to the point where you don't even need an icebreaker anymore. Um, that's what they've been talking about. Hmm? You could have a microphone too. Yes, uh, the second video was from uh, Greenpeace. Where's that coming from? Yeah, oh. but, uh, hello. Uh, but oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah? What happened? Uh, will, the, will the passage be open all year or just... It will summer? be open all year by 2015. But um, let me finish the, 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 the answer, if I could. Um, m the ocean levels will rise. So it's not going to be to the point uh, in 2015 that New York is underwater. It'll be damn close, though, because New York has one of the worst or least existent uh, preparation sort of plans for, for what happens when the water levels rise. But you'll see a dramatic increase as you're already seeing, um, but yet cities still continue to exist somehow. So more, the 2015 was more about the passage to be completely open, and I'll show you the ice while the next question comes up. Yeah? All right, I just wonder where the first video was from, who made it, or, or where was it uh, I can provide published, or who uh, published it? The first video came from a Canadian uh, producer. I don't, I don't have it on me. If you search um, YouTube, yeah. <laughs> you'll find the... Uh, it's called the Arctic Cold War. Yeah, but I mean, uh, information is always dependent on uh, who made it and who gave us the It was a Canadian public this. broadcaster, but I... I don't know. I guess it was the CBC. I, I don't have okay. it on me. Um, but, I mean, what's interesting about that piece is that you have interviews with, like, the, the, the Canadian ambassador to the U.S. And what I was most interested in was, were his comments. And the other thing that I liked about that video a lot, and I could not get, was that the Canadian military has put out videos inviting people to join the Northern Force. So, and I couldn't find the videos on the Canadian military site. No, it but, seems almost like some kind of, I don't know. Somebody invented it because it seems too unreal to be true, too good to be true. Or... I have multiple sources that would show that it is true, but you're right. I, I, I would like to remember who the, yeah. who the source is. But what's funny about that is in the, that same documentary, you see the actual videos. You know it's from the Canadian military, you can tell. And it's inviting young people not only to join the Marines, but to join the Northern Force in protecting the Arctic. I mean, and I couldn't get the, the real video of that, so I, I, I left it off, but it's pretty disturbing. Okay, thanks. Well, I have a, just a remark sure. concerning the physics of melting ice, swimming on water. It does not change the level of water. So if the Arctic melts, that does not change the water level. The big problem, of course, is Greenland and the Antar uh, Antarctic. If this melts, then the water level rises. So, uh, you can try this out with a glass of water. <laughs> but we know that every year the water levels are rising, and in every bit of report that I find about what's happening with the Arctic disintegrating, or, or melting as we say, is that they connect it to rising water levels. Um, you may be into science more than I am, and you can argue that. I just thought I would pass on that that's what I find in all official reports, that they relate, relate it to the rising sea levels. Um, so I'm sure it's not the primary cause of rising sea levels, but it's included. Well, it is, but it's as on Greenland, because melting ice in water already occupies the space. Go back. It's not what in Greenland? Well, the ice that's melting on Greenland, that's melting on land, that makes the water level rise. Oh, okay. I, so I concluded in Greenland. Okay, yeah. I do think it's interesting that the ice on Greenland is melting, though. And this is a huge problem, yes. Yeah. Yeah, hello, here, here. Um, I have a question. Uh, is there any native people who lives in this Arctic, uh, yeah, on this territory? Because we have seen these pictures of these Eskimos. I don't know, maybe they belong to Canada. But are there any native people who could maybe uh, could blame it's their land? Uh, I think the estimation is somewhere in the thousands, 4,000 or so people who actually live in the Arctic, the 
unowned Arctic. But what happens with the Arctic Circle, if you include stuff in the Arctic Circle, that includes, uh, to some extent, the region of Siberia and also Nunavut, um, I don't think Yellowknife, but northern Canada. So sometimes you'll see people included in Arctic reports who actually live in real countries, but then there are a few thousand people who don't live in any official country who are es Eskimo or who live in the, in the Arctic region who, whose life hangs in the sort of balance with all this. But they're already seeing huge changes. Uh, you, you find a lot of uh, information about animals that are either disappearing or appearing more and more, like geese, because now there's so much more green in the Arctic and the, the summer is hotter than it ever was, so their lives are, are changing a great deal. Um, it's true, I didn't talk too much about it, but there are thousands of people whose lives are directly involved with what's going to happen. Um, uh, what was that last part about people getting angry or involved? Or? No, if they have a right to own this land. Oh, if they have a right to own the land. There's no, uh, no one owns the Arctic. Uh, so, uh, you know... <laughs> I, I would say, yes, they should have a right to own their land, but they don't work in the kind of systems that the Western world seems to work in with United Nations and, and borders. Um, maybe they need the transnational, uh, what is it called? The transnational, trans, you know it, <laughs> from the camp. Hi. I wonder uh, if you have any suggestion for all these people in, uh, for their daily life, because they are making this funny war, but... Uh, they are making it because uh, we are uh, every one, every four years uh, citizens and vote, but every day consumers of this oil. So we start with pollution with our cars and everything, but they are making it just because they have to sell it to us. So we can stop it just, uh, not just saying we don't vote for you, but also changing our behavior. Do you have any suggestions? Like, go biking, uh, do this, do that? Well, I would, I would, in general, but also for the Arctic, I would want more people to pay very close attention, whether you're media or not, to what companies are doing. Because the, the influence of the company, of course, in government is great, and it is companies that are leading a lot of these charges. So I would say if it's a publicly held company, uh, even if it's a state company, but publicly held, you might have more power. I would say to pressure companies to watch them, to report about what they do, um, and to, to sort of pass on from person to person the sort of knowledge that you gain about what an oil company is doing in the Arctic. Um, because I think if more people knew, although this is a, a fallible theory, if more people knew, then they would get angry if they really knew what the oil companies were doing. And if companies are made up of people, then you've got to be able to find some of these people and talk to them. Uh, you've got to be able to reach them at some point. So I would like to see more pressure on the companies. Uh, I mean, Greenpeace has its own uh, methods. Uh, as a journalist, I know my method. Um, I'm eager to hear other solutions. Uh, one is, of course, taking the power from oil companies and perhaps using less or needing less uh, oil and gas. But yeah, I have no good ending for that. Huh? OK. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for your nice talk. And uh, there were many things I didn't know about that fact. Um, but uh, yeah, you wanted to show these graphics about these icings, and you didn't show. <laughs> and uh, yes, go on. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about these graphics. And uh, one thing I want to mention is that all these um, water level will rise, pole caps will melt, stuff, climate discussion is also some kind of a hype. And many politicians use this uh, to uh, gain votes also here in Germany, and you also have scientists who say, yes, there is a change, but there always have been changes, mm -hmm. and um, I don't want to say there is no change, there is no <laughs> danger, but uh, I think uh, you have to be, um, yeah, you have to think all these things twice, and don't to become to a hype and say, yeah, there is a big danger, we will all uh, uh, be drowned or something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll let, that, I'll let that be as it is in the end. I don't have much to say about it. Um, the only thing I would add is that even if it's, there's a lot of hype to it, it wouldn't hurt to actually act to stop some of this. It's just like global warming. Whether it exists or not, it wouldn't hurt to use less energy to be more intelligent about how we use things. But it's true. There is a problem when things get trendy, uh, when, when subculture, 
or, or in this case, environmentalism becomes a fad. And that's when companies pretend to be more environmental than they really are. That's called greenwashing. I do a lot of work watching greenwashing. Um, and it's become very common. Uh, that's why when I go to Stat Oil, the, the website, I can't find shit about oil. <laughs> I just find alternative energy, and we're so good. Uh, yeah. I, I think I have maybe time for one more, unless somebody stops me. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, as Denmark is actually involved in the story, it also means that the European Union is involved. So do you have any information about the common position? I don't have too much, um, unless it's going on behind closed doors, which is possible. Unfortunately, the European Union still does a decent amount behind closed doors. Um, people have come up to me during the, the actual Congress and said to me, you know, I think the European Union is involved. In all my statements from Denmark, from Copenhagen, they don't mention any pressure from the European Union. I'm sure the European Union is watching, and they may use Denmark as a sort of, if I use the chess, you know, a pawn. Uh, since there, they have more national call to it. I, I think the European Union does benefit somehow uh, as, as having Denmark as a state. Then again, Denmark isn't always the best of European Union members. Is that, I mean, well. But um, I think they're more behind, involved behind the scenes because they don't have to hurt their uh, profile while Denmark goes out and makes crazy statements about owning or not owning, or not necessarily crazy, but makes their claim. Uh, so I don't get much from the European Union on this issue. I would like to, uh, but not so far. Well, I'm going to end it there. Um, you can uh, one, find me one, pretty... One uh, on the left side, yeah. Uh, Is there time? I want to make sure I respect... Uh, 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 one, 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 one short question. You don't really have to answer that. Oh, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I'll try, though. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned... On the introduction, you mentioned uh, ice bears and penguins and, and so on. Uh, yeah, why uh, uh, ice bears doesn't feed on uh, penguins? I'm just going to let your statement hang in the uh, air. Yeah, yeah. No, penguins uh, live in the Antarctic. 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 On the Arctic. Uh, in the South the Pole. Qu the question was why do. Uh, I don't know. Bears, ice bears don't feed on uh, penguins. Okay, is this like, okay, well, I don't know why. Ne uh, uh, peng penguins uh, live uh, on the South Pole. Oh, it's like a knock knock yeah. kind of, or not without a knock knock. Uh, uh, oh, so, and so, I named sorry, penguins, I, I see. I'm sorry that I named I, penguins. Sorry, I could not resist this. I did, I named penguins. I talk a lot. By the way, this was the, the 2000, 2007 and unmarked year, <laughs> and you see the ice reducing about on the blue line. Anyway, okay. one of my shitty graphics.